Well, something we've talked about uh, the past couple weeks on the show, um, at least in passing, is uh, the issue with screw worm down in the Florida Keys. So for the first time in 30 years in, in this country, in a half a century in Florida, uh, the devastating screw worm is back and has been found in multiple Florida Keys to date. And this has required the euthanasia of 10% of the endangered key deer. To help uh, sort all this out is Dr. Philip Kaufman. Dr. Kaufman is an associate professor of veterinary entomology at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Dr. Kaufman, welcome to the show, sir. Yes, thank you. Glad to be here. Yes, sir. I'm glad to have you. Well, let's go ahead and uh, start out with this. You know, many people hear the name screw worm and they justifiably think of a worm. However, Screw worm is not a worm at all. Can you explain what are we dealing with here? What is the screw worm? So the screw worm is actually a fly. Uh, this fly looks very similar to what people might see on um, dead animals that they find along the road. So it's a metallic fly, but it's very different than the normal metallic flies that we have here in the United States. Uh, this particular fly uh, lays its eggs only on living animals, in particular mammals and some birds. Uh, but the the larvae will essentially drill into, screw into the uh, muscle tissue and, and other tissues of the live animal while they feed, and that's where the damage comes from. All right, so th- this can affect mammals and, and humans, and the infestation is due to the fly landing on a wound and, um, correct me if I'm wrong, and and dropping their larva in there or the yes. eggs. Or... Yes, so the, the fly, an animal will typically will get a, uh, some sort of wound, and it can be as small as a tick bite or a scratch, uh, and the fly senses that open wound and will fly to that animal and lay um, many eggs on the animal. The, those eggs hatch and the larvae crawl into the wound and they keep that wound open. Mm-hmm. The The fly is certainly capable of infesting humans and, and companion animals, so dogs and cats, although we don't see that very often because those animals are looked after pretty carefully as well as ourselves. So this is a little similar to the bot fly, for example. It's a little similar to that, although the bot fly generally doesn't cause widespread damage. The, the challenge with the screw worm is that it continues to feed on living tissue, causing more and more damage, and the wound stays open, and as it stays open, it draws in more flies. And if anyone's seen the, the pictures of the key deer, they can see the devastation that it can have. And it, it, if not treated, it can result in uh, the death of the animal, and in the case of the key deer, uh, some of the animals that they've been able to get to, uh, they've just not been able to save those animals. The damage was too extensive. Right. So it, it's just in there and it's eating tissue, burrowing through tissue. And if it's in there long enough, organs, I imagine. Yes. And, yeah. and it, again, part of the damage comes from where that scratch happens to be. Sure. So if it's in a more sensitive area, then you can have damage occur very quickly versus if it's perhaps on a muscle where it might not uh, be so close to sensitive organs. Yeah, and you, in a, uh, a couple of seconds ago, you mentioned it can be treated, and I saw a report in the Miami Herald today where they're trying right now to um, give prophylactic antibiotics and, uh, and and then again antibiotic shots to early stages of infection. So the antibiotics are effective against the screw worm larva? Well, so the antibiotics are being given in all likelihood to help with the infection that the screw worm is causing. Oh, I see. Uh, I believe that they're also trying to treat the the deer with um, what we would call a parasiticide or an insecticide Mm -hmm. that they're going to feed to the deer. Uh, and that is a systemic compound, kind of like when we take a, you know, maybe a heart pill in the morning and it gets transferred throughout our bodies. This medica- this this drug will essentially kill those very young maggots when they hatch from the egg stage. And so the the idea is to treat them with a preventative so that if they get scratched and have eggs laid on them, those larvae will die when they hatch. The antibiotics are to help treat any. Uh, uh, help heal those wounds so that they are less attractive to the fly anyway. So it's kind of a double um, pro- 
pronged attack to try and reduce this. The other issue is that the treatment is really the removal of the maggots. And so anyone who has an animal that they find infested, if that animal can be brought to a veterinarian and those maggots removed and the wound treated, as long as the existing damage isn't too great, that animal is an excellent chance of recovery. This this is not a disease. It's essentially an infestation of right. maggots. Right. Now, are we, in a human, do we see the same effects if a human's infested? Uh, yeah. So, so the fly doesn't care whether we're a human or, or any other mammal, and so it's going to do its its feeding. Uh, however, most people are going to notice and, and be able to take um, um, action against that. You know, go see their physician or, or someone else will look at it and say, there's something going on here that's odd and let's get some treatment. So that's why in, in most areas we don't see um, humans dying from screwworm. Okay. Um, so it's, you know, it would have the same effect if it wasn't treated. Sure. Well, like I said in the intro, um, it appears the fly is being found in a larger geographic area and about 10% of the key deer population is now gone. Um, as an entomologist, how concerned are you? Well, the key deer is an endangered species, and there are several other uh, threatened and endangered species down on the keys, so it is, it is very important. Uh, what we're um, hopeful for is that, that this infestation has been confined to those uh, cluster of, of keys down there, uh, what we really don't want to have happen is for the fly to make it to the uh, mainland of Florida because then it becomes not only more difficult to control, but it'll also be much more ex- uh, expensive and there are uh, considerably more hosts for the fly to get onto. Uh, um, you know, the key deer, they've euthanized about 10% of the population as I understand it. Right. Um, I believe most of those have been bucks, so at least the females have been largely spared. But when you're dealing with an endangered species like that, any loss of genetic material is really, really important. Sure. Now, uh, how would, how does this spread? How how would how could it spread to the the uh, mainland of Florida? Well, the the primary way that it would would be spread would be people transporting the fly larvae in animals that they're moving from the keys, and that's why the the state. Uh, has set up the quarantine inspection sites. I believe it's just south of Key Largo, um, and and they those inspection sites are critical. They they really need to look at all the animals leaving the keys to see that they don't contain the maggots um, or the larvae. Uh, and and if we can do that, you know, the fly isn't really capable of of. Um, covering great distances, so it's very unlikely that it would fly from those keys to the mainland by itself. Right. Now, do you know definitively, you know, how the screw worm arrived again in the U.S. after so many decades? Uh, As far as I'm aware, no one has determined that. Uh, The most likely path is that someone visiting one of the either islands that still have screw worm in the Caribbean or one of the South American countries that, that have it um, transported an animal to the Florida Keys mm-hmm. that had an infestation. And then those maggots finish developing on that host. They leave the host to, to turn into pupae, which are kind of like uh, caterpillar chrysalises. Mm-hmm. And then those flies emerged on the Keys and, and the infestation began. Uh, I would believe that they are going to be attempting to locate where this came from. Um, and they probably could use genetic tools um, if, if they're able to gather enough material from the um, variety of places that still have an infestation. Um, but I'm not aware of, of that work progressing. It's a bit early. At this sure. Point, I imagine. Uh, how much of an issue is screw worm outside the U.S.? You mentioned that you believe it came in from outside the country. Yeah, so, so screw worm is still um, present and... and um, problematic in the countries where it exists. So in the Caribbean, the, the two major islands that, that still have screw worm are Cuba and Jamaica. Um, however, it does exist in multiple countries in South America. Um, essentially, it's, it, the, the U.S. working with other countries in Central America and as well as Mexico have eradicated this fly down to an area south of the Panama Canal. And we maintain an eradication zone in there to prevent the fly from coming back up uh, through that part of, of North America. And 
so the the challenge with eradicating it further south is that obviously South America gets wider and um, more dense with uh, foliage, so it's it's considerably more expensive. Um, but it it is still a problem in those in those countries. Um, I personally have not been there to to witness that. Right. Now, what can um, agricultural um, uh, department, what can they do to get this under control? And I would like you to uh, specifically explain about the sterile flies and how that works. Sure. So the the federal government is, is the group that's leading the effort in the eradication program, uh, and they work uh, collaboratively with the state as, you know, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Agriculture Research Service um, for the federal government, State Department of Agriculture, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission. We have a lot of groups that are uh, coordinating with each other to do this. Um, the, the concept of the sterile mail release um, goes back oh, probably 70 or 80 years now, um, where where they determined that this fly um, had certain characteristics that might um, allow this technique to to work, um, the idea is that the fly itself doesn't occur in large numbers. When you think of it, say compared to a house fly, where there are lots and lots of those, um, and the female fly only mates once, and if she happens to mate with a sterile male. She will produce eggs, but those eggs will never hatch. And so the idea is, is if you can release so many sterile males, you can get those males just mathematically are most likely to mate with that those wild females. And then she essentially, although you're not killing her, you're essentially killing her opportunity to contribute to the next generation of flies. You're removing her from the population and all of her offspring. The the fly is not genetically modified. The fly is irradiated when it's in the pupil stage, and it's a technique that they've been using for, for all of these years, uh, and they produce the fly in massive quantities uh, at a uh, production facility down in Panama, uh, and they have it there because that's where the current releases are. As I understand it, the they're releasing a, close to 2 million uh, sterile males or 2 million flies um, about every three or four days across these keys. Uh, and the idea is to keep the population of males up in the area and so that any time a female fly emerges from a pupil case and, and becomes a new female, that she is going to mate with one of these males. They also have a very good surveillance program up with traps. So the, the USDA developed years ago a, a, a monitoring uh, think of it like a perfume. It's it's a type of pheromone um, bait that the female flies find very attractive, and it's called swarm lure. And they set these traps out with this bait in it, and the wild flies will, will come to those. So any fly they trap also won't be laying any eggs in the future. But it also gives them an idea of how many flies are in an area and where they're at. And that's how they detected uh, some of these populations on some of the nearby keys more recently. And they had already planned to do releases over those areas, but now they have an, a better understanding of the distribution of the fly. Now, now prior to this uh, um, I don't know, outbreak right now that's going on, um, that started in September, it, did the Florida Department of Agriculture um, do surveillance for screw worm while there was none going on? Is this a routine thing that they do? No, no, we don't. We, because this fly really hasn't um, had a local population in the United States right. in the 30-plus years, it's not something that we survey for. Gotcha. But at all of the ports of entry, whenever anyone who's traveled internationally comes back, you go through customs, and you have to present um, certainly any pets that you bring back. And so there have been interceptions of pets coming back in the past that they've found maggots on and, and stopped those. Um, and so it's not, it's not as if we've never seen this fly in the past 30 years. It's just the first time that it's gotten here and started developing populations locally. Okay. And uh, last question, Dr. Kaufman, is do you have any advice for people on protecting themselves and their pets and livestock if that's what they have? Sure. 
So the, the first thing is to check your animals as often as you can for uh, scratches, particularly in, in, if you're in the Florida Keys. Uh, there have been no interceptions of flies in the peninsula of Florida, and all of the about 1,100 pets that have left the Florida Keys have been inspected, and they've not found any infestations. So the likelihood is very low, but it is absolutely critical that people recognize if they have cuts on their animals that aren't healing or are, the wounds are weeping, you may not be able to see these maggots if, if they're down deep enough or small enough. And so you need to present your animal to a veterinarian. Uh, their livestock production is not, um, doesn't occur on the Florida Keys, and so we don't, we don't have that concern at this point. And that's where we're largely seeing the effect on the, on the key deer. Um, but again, your veterinarian has the, the capacity to remove those maggots, treat the wound, and they'll submit those maggots to the proper authorities for, for an identification. Uh, the other, the other uh, bit of information to convey is the State uh, Department of Agriculture has a, a wonderful site up, and if you go to freshfromflorida.com, at the very top of that page, there's a, a red bar that you can click on that gives you updated information on the screw worm, as well as who to contact if you suspect uh, that you may see something like this. Oh, very good. Great advice. I want to thank you, Dr. Phil Kaufman, for your time and expertise, sir. Thank you. I appreciate it.